Hi, you're listening to Recommendations from My Taco Spouse. I'm Jen. And I'm Wesley. So let's get started. And in this episode, we are going back to American cartoons. Back to? Back to. Have we talked about them before? Yes, we talked about Centaur World. We did talk about Centaur World. Yep, yep. Actually, you know what, for a podcast that's kind of... A part of the Annie Bros, i.e. anime-centric podcast, we don't talk about anime that often. Uh, no, but I do know we have an episode about a manga coming up. We do, yes, you can look forward to that. like a non-animated anime. What? How is that physically possible? I mean, it's actually physical. Physical, physical. Okay. So many anime we watch nowadays are digital, and we don't actually have a physical product. But a manga, you can get those digitally, but we still mostly get them physically. Yes, Wes. Anyway. Anyway, so we watched- Cartoons. A, cartoons. We watched an American cartoon digitally. We did watch an American cartoon digitally, yes. Yes. Excellent. Yep, that's it. We're back on topic. I promise you're no gonna you're, segues. You're going to get segued. Segued? <laughs> anyway, never mind. So, we're talking this episode about Owl House, which- The Owl House. The Owl House. Oh, this is a, there's a the in front of it? Yes, it was on every title screen we saw. Oh. I mean, the Owl House, oh yeah, hang on, the the Owl House part of the Owl House was bigger than the the, so I didn't actually register that there was a the in there, but now that you mention it, yes. You just don't read the title screen, do you? No. Why? I thought it was actually pretty well done up. Whoever did the title design for that did a good job with the way that the palisman on the staff actually fit rather well into the letters. It's small details like that, but I think that small details sometimes add up to enhance the whole. Actually- This show was full of tiny little details, which was kind of awesome. It was, yeah, actually. So The Owl House is a show on Cart... No, wait, not Cartoon Network. (laughs) It's a show on Disney+. Plus. Yes. Started in 2020, finished in 2023, so the whole story is complete, and we only just got around to it because we didn't know about it exactly until I saw a bunch of comics online, and I thought, oh, this looks good, I wonder what it's from. Oh, it's from a Disney show. Let's watch it. And then we watched it. And now I'm really glad that we watched it when it was finished, because it would have sucked if we watched it as the episodes were coming out. Yeah. Yeah, it would have. I've been aware of the Owl House for longer than you then, I guess. Really? Like, in that it existed. Oh, okay. But I knew very little about it, just that it was a thing. Mm. Yeah, I guess we'll probably get into that a bit more later. Okay. But I'm glad that we were able to watch it at our speed rather than Disney's speed. Yep. Screw you, Disney. We said still watching it. So the Owl House is kind of a weird girl gets isekai'd uh, and ends up in a weird world where she is basically not the one, Can but- you say she gets isekai'd if she wasn't hit by a truck? Yes. You can get isekai'd. All right. In the traditional way people were isekai'd, she was isekai'd. That's that's fair enough, yeah. In the night so she got nineties isekai. She got nineties isekai, yeah. Modern isekai. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No I'm trucks were involved. <laughs> and then she's basically I wanna say she's the one. No, but she is kind of She's rambunctious and she puts herself into trouble. Yeah. And she puts herself out there. She, I mean, she she's learns... the main character, so she is the one, but yeah. she's not like Neo the one. No, but I feel like she as the protagonist, she is the one who goes off and, you know, fights bad guys and I think is both the cause and solution to everyone's okay, problems. Okay. I was about to say, I think that every problem she solves, she started. Yes. I don't think there's many, if any, that she didn't, at the very least, exacerbate. Yes. <laughs> like, the very, very first thing she does is break into prison. She, in this case, being the main character, being Luce. Her name is yes. Luce. Yes. Luce Nasea. Very important. Luce Nasea. Which is actually kind of awesome because I think this is also like the first time you have Latin American protagonist in a children's cartoon? I, Someone's going to prove me wrong. But. I wouldn't even make that as a claim. Okay. I don't know. I just, there was a lot of Spanish I didn't understand, but I could kind of grasp based on the context. And I feel like we're seeing that a lot more in American cartoons because there is such a large population of people in America who speak. Spanish. So yeah. it makes sense, and it's kind of awesome. I did find it really interesting that a lot of the Spanish wasn't translated, except for a few crucial lines towards the end of the series. Mm-hmm. For the most part, it's used to add flavor. Yeah. And then 
But we saw that also recently with Disney with Encanto. Yes, I was just thinking the exact same thing. Where there was an entire Spanish song that was left untranslated. Yep. 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 And I... For English audiences. missed it. Yes. Yeah. Did we talk about Encanto on the podcast? I feel I like we so, did. No? no? Okay. But yeah. I think the, it's definitely happening more and more. And actually, that kind of ties into some one th- other thing I wanted to talk about was just how diverse the show was and how good that was. You don't see it like there was a really big LGBT element to the show, like not in an in your face kind of way, just a, oh, that's kind of awesome. These characters, there's all kinds of different characters in it. And that's definitely not something you see in a lot of children's cartoons. So I wasn't, as I said, I was vaguely aware that this show existed, but I didn't pay any attention to it. And I've had some beef with Disney over the past couple of years with, I don't know the proper term to put in here. LGBT representation in movies. That's the way to put it in TV shows. Mm -hmm. Mainly because it feels like, I feel like there's been at least five Disney movies over the past couple of years (laughs) that have been advertised as having Disney's first LGBTQ character. Yeah. And I don't know how they've had five first characters, (laughs) but they keep doing it. Yeah. And so I don't remember that coming out about this one, probably because Disney doesn't actually promote TV shows that aren't Marvel. I think also or because Star Wars. movies movies are aimed at a general audience because they want like a wide number of people to go go to the cinema and see it. Whereas TV shows they aim at a very specific audience, and actually that's one reason the that season three was so short was because Disney said, you it's know, it's not getting the audience we want. It's not getting the audience we want. It's not getting the cho- the young people audience. It's getting the older, probably our generation, <laughs> like people in their in their teens and twenties watching it. I can see why that would screw with Disney because you have to sell your ad blocks. Yeah. It'd be really weird to all of a sudden have an ad block full of do you need health insurance amidst <laughs> all your other toys? To, to be honest, I think Disney underestimates the desire of twenty to thirty year olds wanting super soakers. Everyone wants super soakers. Exactly. They can sell toys in those ad blocks. But that's the other thing that gets to me is that they, a lot well, of times when you get these shows like this, they get canceled because they're appealing to the wrong audience. Yeah. Wrong and massive air quotes there. Like, they never made toys for this show. No. So they're not trying to sell Owl House toys to kids. I guess it's just the fact that their, their advertisements are designed towards kids. And we- if your kids aren't watching it, then you're going to get less impression from the people who are buying your ad space. No, but why are we talking about ad space? It's streaming, isn't it? Streaming. Well, it's no, Disney Plus. Like, it, it is it, now, but it was originally on TV, wasn't it? I honestly I think it was originally don't on TV. No. I, mean, I guess that would make sense on like the Disney Channel. Yeah. I think yeah, it was originally okay. on the Disney Channel and then they moved it now to streaming. Yeah, that would make sense. I think the third season was only streaming, but I think the first and second season actually had okay. TV broadcast. And that would have ad space. You're absolutely right. I guess in my head I'm thinking again, Cartoon Network with Cartoon Disney. Network has actual ad broadcast. space, yeah. And then they also do streaming now, but I don't think they do it through them. T- American TV and their licensing is getting really weird and really annoying mm-hmm. really quickly. Yeah. So I'm going to ignore most of that. Yeah. But so I guess I, I, but I don't want to be too like dick writing for a corporation here, but this show did have the double whammy of probably being expensive because the animation was good and B hitting right as COVID hit. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, 2020 to 2023 was... I think it didn't launch in 2019. I think it was being made in 2019 and came out in 2020. Yeah, and prime so COVID. That would have been right when all the Disney parks suddenly weren't making money. That would have been right when all the theaters shut down. Yeah. That would have been, you know, I know there was a couple Marvel movies that went straight to streaming and stuff like that. Disney was missing out on a lot of revenue there. And I think that would have caused the accountants to freak out. Yeah. And so, if something like this wasn't appealing to the right audience and therefore threatening another revenue stream at a time when they didn't have as many revenue streams, I can see why Disney freaked. Still, they have enough money. Fuck them. But I can see why (laughs) Disney freaked. So, going back to the whole um, possibly why Disney... Well, again, like, Disney are really getting more LGBT positive. Kind of. I mean, I feel like um, the movies, at least, a lot of it is just we want to advertise it. There's the whole Disney Florida... And hosting an LGBT convention to say F you to... Yeah, but would they have done DeSantis? that if DeSantis wasn't a dick? Mm-hmm. I, don't, I have no idea. I feel like I feel like they if it, if it really was a bigger deal to them, they probably wouldn't have. 
But the fact that they're really fighting back is... They're not a... Again, again, they're not a good people. Disney is not a good corporation. It is late-stage capitalism at its worst. But at least it's not the the worst. At least it's like giving us great shows like The Owl House and... And taking them away. And taking them away. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I feel so conflicted. <laughs> No, but I wanted to say how just, like, we didn't have any LGBT representation in children's cartoons when I was young. Like, I remember when... I always thought the Care Bears were pretty gay. Yeah, but that's not, like, they're never out... Right? What? What? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. They were walking around firing rainbows out of their bellies. How is... Okay, that was kind of before the whole rainbow thing became a massive symbol of LGBT community. But anyway, (laughs) you're just doing this to confuse me. I am 100%. Yes. Yes, I am. Um, No, I agree that there wasn't... I mean... I feel that... I remember that... Outside of token romance, so there wasn't much romance in old cartoons either. Yes. Well... Like, okay, He-Man had a princess, but... Okay. I, there okay. was never really romance in Transformers. There was never really. I mean, now they've made you know RC sexy, so you can have a sexy robot. But I feel like that's not romance. That's not. That's not. Yeah, good but, for kids. But also, you're going back to a generation of cartoons that I missed. That's fair enough. I am American, and you're not. Yes. What about Postman Pat? That's aimed at like really small kids. Okay. No, but I, I do. <laughs> I think Lottie. that interpersonal relationships like this are becoming more of a role in cartoons. And with that, we are getting more representation through shows like this yeah. than we had in the past. Yeah. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Or like how in um, Avatar, Aang the Last Airbender, you have Aang and his love interest. Katara. Katara. And then in the sequel, what's the face? Asami and Korra. Asami and Korra, thank you, yeah. I never watched that show. Why do I know the names better than you? <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, at the end of that, they were like, oh, we really wanted them to kind of be together, but we didn't want to make it explicit because Cartoon Network might not have let us show it. And so we had like the hand holding. And then since then, it feels like it's already exploded uh, with like She-Ra and Owl House and trying to remember all those other cartoons that I forgot. I'm not entirely sure unless it's just those two that I can remember off my head now. Fair enough. Although... (laughs) I guess part of it in my head, why I'm going like, yeah, I like, I, I recognize that it is a newer thing in Western cartoons, but part of it in my head is going, no, nah, I swear I've seen this before. And I think some of that is because of my exposure to Japanese media. Yes. Where it is more frequent. Yeah. Like I was just thinking earlier today that I think the gayest cartoon I've ever seen has to be Run Like the Wind uh. or The Wind Races By, whatever it's called in English. I don't remember. Kazuga Siyoku Futeru. That we... we I don't mean, you were talking about uh, Avatar 2, whatever it's called, Legend of Korra. Legend of Korra. About how they didn't want to make it explicit. I don't think anything's made explicit in like Rotten Like the Wind, but I still think it's the gayest cartoon I've ever seen in my life, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. But again, again, I guess that's not explicit. If I think about explicit I don't gay think any wrong. relationships in anime, I'm thinking Cardcaptor Sakura, where her brother and his best friend have a relationship, and they completely cut it out of the Western release when that was aired on television. That's true. I was going to Sailor Moon, but they were cousins. In the Western release. <laughs> yeah. But you still knew. Yeah. It was kind of obvious. You can't hide it from us. You notice, though, how it's always lesbians? I just said! Sakura's brother okay, and his that's best in the, friend. That's in the West, though, but... Or that's in uh, anime again. Yeah. But in all of the... I think the only non-lesbian one that I can remember recently... Oh, I guess Willow's parents in this yeah, one, Will- but they Will- were a side character. Willow's but dad's a... Technically, the kid from Strange Planet. But that fits into my Disney's coming up with bullshit so they can advertise another gay character and it has no effect on the plot, so fuck them. But I think it's good that it doesn't have an effect on the plot. Like, I think it's... I, I get that's like in the Owl House. It, oh, okay. None of it was... None of it had an impact on the plot, per se, I'm okay with normalizing it and it not having an effect on the plot yeah. if you don't advertise it. Yes. Like Jim Carrey when he was like, I'm fine to be in your movie, but don't advertise it. That is me. And then they advertised it and he was like, uh... Yeah. Robin Williams? Yeah. You said Jim Carrey. Did I say Jim Carrey? You did. It's okay. No, um, I get that. But Robin yeah, Williams. so I guess like... Yeah. So many of the times... We're getting slightly off subject. But I feel like so many <laughs> times that homosexuality or any sort of queerness is advertised in a western product 
it's done in such a minor way that you can easily remove it for when you want to sell it in the Middle East and China. Yeah. And yeah. so in this, when it was so front forward. Yeah, front and center. You can't ignore it and you can't replace it. Mm-hmm. It becomes an intrinsic part of the media. Yeah. Which is good. You know, it's not coming out in an interview afterwards to say a main character was gay. Or coming out in an interview afterwards and saying, no, they totally didn't get married. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They just wanted to leave it up to viewer interpretation, Jen. That's (laughs) bullcrap. And they know it. (laughs) Don't push your homonormative agenda on me. (laughs) I'm not! The showrunners literally made it to be gay. They literally got married. Ah! Not on screen. It's like when you die off screen. It doesn't count. That's rubbish, and you know it, and you're just saying that to annoy me. 100% I am. Uh. But, But back on topic of this. So... It is annoying. We've, we've rambled on it for about a bit, but what did you think about the Owl House then? Oh, okay. Beyond yes. just representation. Or including, rep- I don't care. I mean, actually, just one point. It is very annoying when you like, companies, big corporations just sell gay in order to make more money instead of actually promoting stuff. But yes. There's a word and- for it, but I forgot what it was. Queer baiting? No, no. Queer baiting is when you promise that there is, or you hint that there is, and then there isn't anything. Oh. Well, that's... In this show, there was a lot of queer. Anyway, yeah, in the show, there definitely was. Yeah. So, what did I like? Um, I like the queerness. I like the diversity. I just really enjoyed the animation, actually. was What I found really impressive was that the animation was really high quality at very specific parts. like When it needed to be. When it needed to be. Like, normally when there was a fight, and then it got really impressive, and I was like, whoa, like, Steven Universe was... Ah, Steven Universe! That's another queer one! <laughs> Steven Universe was great, but there were not many parts where the animation was very high quality, and even you pointed out how... The animation was really bad in Steven Universe. And ha- you pointed out how the animation was inconsistent. Yeah. Um, but there were a couple of parts towards the end of the series, end of Steven Universe, where it got really good, and that's because they got uh, James Baxter. Oh. Did they? Yeah. The I scene- didn't see any horses. <laughs> yeah they got they got him involved i think it was or was it john bluth i i mean those are both great animators they're both great animators yeah um but it felt like they were actually for owl house trying to incorporate that style of of high quality animation sometimes there were there were a couple of parts where they overly animated it in a really shiny way like which I think was a little too excessive because then it really stood out and it wasn't in keeping with the rest of the the show. But it wasn't keeping with the local aesthetic. It wasn't keeping it with the local aesthetic, but it was really good and the story was fantastic. Like I really enjoyed the story. Good. You know, so on the animation, I've spoken before. I know I brought it up in our Promare episode about how I like when studios use their budget smartly. Yeah. And I think this show did that really well. Yeah. I think there was a couple of bits, especially leading into a high budget scene where it almost felt like they were going along at a kind of a, this is our standard pace and they would dip almost. And you had this bit where it just almost looked like cutouts and then it would leap into this really high budget scene yeah. and then kind of go back to the standard. And so it was always weird to me to see the, huh, it dropped. Oh no, wait, here we go. Yeah. So that was always interesting, but- yeah, and it was – animators deserve to get paid. Yes. But the high-budget scenes in this reminded me of what I used to see in 90s cartoons. Is like, there was actually, though? Because I'm thinking, like, 90s cartoons, like Batman and stuff, and I don't think the animation was – I'm thinking, like, Batman the Animated Series. Yeah, the animation in uh, think- Batman was impressive, but not, like – not that smooth I think- Anastasia style of fluid movement The Oh, that's John Bluth's mm, method. Yeah, that had a lot more money behind it. I, th- I think it's more... It was consistent. In a lot of the shots that you see before they get to the fun bits, the shots are really static. Yeah, And yeah. that you have characters on a flat background and everything. And so when they went into the money scenes, you didn't have that flat background anymore that I felt. I felt like they were doing more with perspective and how the characters moved across it and doing like full body movements rather than just cartoon movements, if that makes sense. Yeah. You kind of get that standard look. And that reminded me of some of the better animated episodes and things like Batman or Superman or the Justice League that I used to watch in the late 90s, early 2000s, which had their own problems too. You know, you go back and you rewatch Batman and you see some of the episodes are just horribly animated and some are really good. But again, 
the team knew that. They knew which, in that case, which Japanese studio they were farming it out to and making Batman. Mm -hmm. And so when they wrote an episode that needed better animation, they'd make sure that it would go to the right team. Yeah. And so on this, I feel like rather than doing it episode by episode like that to whoever they farmed it out to, they were doing it on a scene by scene basis where they were going, okay, this scene needs more emphasis, more oomph Mm -hmm. for the audience. Let's put the money in here. And so instead of an episode by episode, just what you get back from whoever you sent it to, you're getting it on a scene by scene. And I think they did that really well in picking and choosing. That reminds me actually of um, Carmen Sadiego. Yes. I can't remember if we talked about that. I don't think we did. I'm just kind of surprised because we... That was kind of fun. I rather enjoyed Carmen Sandiego. I think... No. Actually, well, go ahead. Um, well, the point I was going to say about Carmen Sandiego was it had... I think it had very consistent animation style and it had a very distinct art style. Yes. Which is really good. It reminded me a lot of the e insurance ads that were in the US. Any of our American viewers will understand what I'm saying. Yeah, I have no idea what we were talking about. But those all got taken off the air because of too much internet porn, so... What? There was a whole series of uh, cartoon advertisements in the US for insurance. Okay. They were kind of in the same style as what became the Carmen Sandiego look. Okay. But then people on the internet started drawing porn about the insurance character <laughs> and the insurance company. Well, it's the internet. <laughs> it was the same thing happened to Bioshock Infinite. But then, but so the insurance company was like, we can't be associated with this. And that whole camp- ad campaign got axed. It says, again, going off topic, we watched a trailer. We watched what we thought was a trailer for an anime animated oh, by yeah. MAPPA yesterday. We did, yeah. And it turned out to be an advert for, like, hair gel oh, for or men or something. We're like, what the hell? Anyway, sorry, yeah. speaking of, like, people picking up characters, is that why so many adverts just have things like, you know, like, Affleck has the duck? Maybe. I don't... I mean, Affleck had the duck before the each yes, scandal. Yes, but I mean... But, but no, nobody but puts uh, humans in... in Nobody puts humans in trailers or adverts for products because the internet is weird and people are way too horny the internet for is Maine. Really but I'm getting off topic again. Sorry. We were talking about Carmen Sandiego yes. and it was well animated. Yes. But the point I was re- going to make was, yes, Carmen Sa- San Diego was really well animated, but it came out after the fact that they farmed it all out to Vietnamese studio. That just was an absolute, basically, racket in terms of like bad quality of like just bad pay extreme demands of the animators to the point of several people burning out and getting sick and it's i I honestly don't know if any of that happened with the ahos but i really hope not (laughs) i it's like why can't we have good animation and also not kill people to get it i for your own sake i probably wouldn't look into whoever the animation studio was for the ahos then i don't know i don't remember watching the credits for it but now I have to look. The, I mean, what's the big animation darling right now? Um, Arcane? I was thinking Spider-Verse. Oh, Spider-Verse, yeah. And as soon as that movie came out, everyone was talking about the horrific working conditions to be working on that. <sighs> yeah. It's not acceptable. No. But, it, I mean, you and I work in Japanese to English translation. The bottom of the totem pole is always going to get abused. Yeah. The show is animated by Rough Draft Korea, Sunmin Image Pictures, and Sugar Cube Animation. That's All I'm saying it. is if Disney went to Korea for the animation, it's because it was cheap. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, That's why I, so I don't anime, think... I mean, there, I was talking about how in the 90s, uh, American TV was farming it out to Japan, and that's because it was cheap. Mm-hmm. And then Japan starting farming it out to Korea because it was cheap. And now Japan's moving it to Vietnam and Thailand because, because it's, it's cheap. cheap. Yeah. So, I... I haven't heard any specific horror stories about this, but I'm also not going to go looking for them because they probably exist. Yeah. Which is a shame. It's all animation farms. All the way down. <laughs> I was I was setting up for Always Has Been, but that works too. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. But I do think visually, I mean, there were scenes that were poor, but I think visually they put it where it needed to be. Yeah. As I said, so. Which is definitely a step up from some shows. Like, um, I, you haven't seen She-Ra. I've not. I really liked it. I loved it, apart from one thing. The animation was really bad. <laughs> like, the animation was paper cutout level bad. It was worse than Steam Universe. Steven Universe. Okay, okay, okay. I ragged on Steven Universe earlier. Steven Universe was fluid. Steven Universe could not stick to a character model to save their life. Like, Back-to-back scenes would have characters wildly out of proportion with each other, and it just annoyed me. Fair enough. 
So that's actually why I haven't shown you Shira yet, is because I think you would find the animation annoying. But the story's really good. I, I, yeah, it's it's tough because again, budget and but the okay, people so involved in it. And- that's going to lead into something else I want to talk about the outhouse. Okay, because I keep talking about how one of the things that I enjoyed about this and things like Promare and all that is wisely using your budget in a way that counts. Yes, and so if you don't have the budget to make a cartoon of that length, cut your story back and make it shorter. You mean like three, one and a half hour, or three hour long episodes? Yeah, yeah. Which they did in season three. So for the Owl House, the rough story that I have is that they did season one, they were greenlit for season two, and then before they really got into the meat of making season two, Disney came along and said, look, you still get this, but this is it. You're done. And the creator, Dana Terrace, went to Disney, fought with them for a bit, and managed to also eke out the three special episodes that would come season three. So we're in between season one and season two. They know that we at least have season two and nothing else. Possibly they're getting the special for season three. And this is one of my complaints about Owl House, is that I think season two was poorly paced. I think season one, it feels like a Western cartoon. Yeah. Um, especially kind of Monster that of the Week kind of style. Kind of Monster of the Week, but I think it did a really good job at dropping the hints and the story beats that you needed to ramp up to the finale. Yeah. I thought the finale of season one was really well done, and I thought that all the framework had been placed throughout the 18 episodes prior. Mm-hmm. So you kind of have that, let's get introduced to the Boiling Isles, let's ramp up, let's put in the story beats that we need to in individual episodes that can stand alone, mm-hmm. which is very important to someone like Disney, who's going to you know, you can't guarantee a kid's going to tune in every week Yep. while still building up to a very satisfying final episode for the season. Your big finale, get people to come back whenever season two comes out. Season two, because we didn't have to wait. Yeah. We talked about this earlier about how we watched it now, so we can just watch it at our own pace. So we went straight from season one into season two with no break. I almost got whiplash because when season two kicks off, everything is suddenly moving at 100 miles an hour. You don't get that ramp from season one. It's just move, 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 move. And it was so fast at times, it almost felt like you weren't giving things time to breathe. I, it wasn't bad. And I, having seen season three, which I'll get to season three, but <laughs> like they start, they had where they were at the end of season one mm-hmm. and they had the story that they wanted to conclude with, which would become season three. And so they're like, okay. And I feel like things were cut out. I feel like a lot of things were cut yeah. out, which is good yeah. because you had to cut something out when you're crunching it in. Kill your darlings. I feel like they almost could have killed more though, because it was just so fast moving at season two that A, I feel like none of the episodes really stood alone as much. And B, it just, I mean, what was the one episode? Um, knock, knock, knocking on Hootie's door, which... I actually remember oh. quite a few of the episode names because they were really clever and they made me laugh. But <laughs> that was three episodes in one. Yeah. They were like, we need to get these story beats in for three main characters so that they're ready before season three kicks off. And so they took three episodes worth of stuff, put it into one, used Hootie as a framing device, and shoved it out the door. That was a lot in one episode. That was, but it was also really clever how they did it. I think it worked. I think it worked again. I just think that they were packing in so much like, to the point that there was a lot of episodes in season two that they were just so pressed for time, you didn't even get the opening credits. That's true, yeah. There was a lot of, especially as you started to get to the second half of season two, you'd kind of just get a cold open title screen and we're back in the episode. Whereas every episode in season one had the full credit sequence because they had the time for it because the show could breathe. I don't, I actually really liked the pacing of season two. But I'm also, you know, an adult in her 30s who has a full-time job and doesn't really have much time to watch 50 episodes of the latest anime. And so having a fast-paced show that is like, bam, 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 here's all the story really had me hooked because it had me going, okay, I'm back from work next episode. I got accustomed to it. I think it was just coming off of season one right into it. As I said, it gave me kind of that whiplash that, oh, here we go. Yeah. I guess I didn't notice it. Maybe it's also a tension thing. Like, if I I find myself when we're watching stuff sometimes picking up my phone before the end of, like, the YouTube video we're watching or something. (laughs) 
<laughs> I know, I know, it is so bad, and so many like modern day audiences have the attention span of, um, oh wait, what's that? <laughs> but on the flip side, so after ragging all that, so then season three came out, yeah. which was instead of being a season, it was like three fifty minute episodes, and I thought those were really well paced. I did laugh at the fact that at the beginning of two of the episodes in season three, it started with a montage. When earlier <laughs> yeah. in the series, I think it's season one, they were kind of ragging on the ideas of montages a little bit. Not ragging on it, but tongue and cheeking it. Yeah. But then they were just like, look, we got things to say. We're putting in a montage. And so you got a really quick montage at the beginning of episode one and episode two in season three. But maybe because it was the big finale, I feel more care was put into it to get, to keep your pacing through those three episodes. Because all in all, three 50-minute episodes is about nine standard episodes. Yeah, I think so. It's probably about half the length of season one and two. Yeah, maybe yeah. eight, but so about half the. And but I think that the pacing worked really well in season three. I thought that they really they, they realized the reality of their new situation and were able to pivot mm. to make the story they wanted to tell fit that pretty well. Yeah, and I guess it was very smart making it into three longer episodes rather than nine short episodes because in an episode you want. A beginning, middle, and end with a satisfying conclusion that leads you to the next episode, but they couldn't they couldn't get that without bloating the story, and so it made sense to have it into three episodes where they could keep it very focused. Yeah, there were a couple of bits in those episodes that I felt like you could still feel where the episode would have been, like the ending of an episode. Yeah, would have been. there was one key bit in episode three that was the end of an episode that was not the end of the episode. But as soon as I saw it, I was like, ah, oh, this is where you would have cut it off to make people go, <gasps> and to drive everyone insane online until the next episode aired. Yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, that bit was so good. I don't want to give any spoilers, but. Ah, uh, so good. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I feel that, and it could have been because you had more time to plan. As I said, it was somewhere in between the season two has been greenlit to season two is being produced that Disney axed them. So that could have been a lot more frantic. We don't have as much time to plan. We just need to get things out the door. And this is all conjecture, by the way, based on context. I mean, yeah. I'm sure people have said online when exactly they were told, but yeah. yeah. But I, yeah. So I feel that giving people more time to plan and knowledge of their future is a good thing if you expect a consistent product. Who'd have thought? I'm, of course, completely insane by that. And everyone knows that you just need to keep living that grindcore lifestyle or whatever the fuck it's called nowadays. Crunch? Crunch as in, well, crunch is, I don't know. There's a different crunch, one. Crunch is gaming. Oh, okay. Gaming specific. Yeah. But kind but of crunch, crunch is like animation. Yeah. When you're dying towards the end. Towards so, the end. <laughs> yeah. So it's supposed to be. <laughs> supposed to be. Yeah. But there's another one, some sort of uh, the grind mentality. I don't know. It's some stupid that bullshit about right. modern day. Late stage capitalism. Garbage. Anyway. <laughs> so yeah. So. Also, one thing that I found weird, and this is could have been a result of to it to me, was the faster pacing in season two. I felt some characters changed really quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, Gus's voice dropped. I think that was probably because of the voice actor. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to blame Gus. Yeah. I, I, I liked how they called that out, though. They were like, well, your voice has changed. Oh, yeah. Witch puberty. Yep. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and his voice breaks a couple times in that episode, and then you're done. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I think the one that got... That I noticed the most? I don't think it got to me. I think I just noticed it the most and I was like, huh, okay. And then rolled with it was King. King at the beginning, King being for listeners who haven't seen it. This adorable little demon. He's a he's a shiny cue bone that's a d- demon that hangs out with Eda the Owl Lady. <laughs> yeah. In the Owl House. That's the title of the show. At the beginning, he seemed more like a hench or a sidekick. Kind of like if you gave a cat the ability to speak. Where bit of a Napoleon complex, but still very, not on par with Ida, but like they're more of a Manzai duo. Yeah. They're really Japanese. And by the end of it, he went from childish to a child. Ah, uh, Like yeah. I don't, if you, if I had watched the first, I don't know, the first 10 episodes, so first half of season one, and you'd asked me to slap an age on King, it would not have been what it ended up being later. <laughs> I guess it was just as they were making the show, they would feeling out everybody's characters and really developing them because you really develop like no matter how much you plan you're going to develop characters as you create a story yeah especially as you get used to their interactions with other people yeah yeah and it makes sense to me but it was just that one stood out to me a bunch 
just as a kind of, it was one of those, as we were watching the show, it was like watching the show. And as I sat back to think about it later, I was like, huh, weird. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. So I guess we just talked a lot about the Owl House without actually talking about the Owl House, which is good. I didn't want to give spoilers. No. Because I mean, if you don't, I, no, neither of us really knew anything about it when we went in. And I'm really glad we didn't. Yeah. I guess, yeah. You've got small American child teams up with... Otherworldly witch and demon. Ryoko and Cubone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she is Ryoko from Tenshi Muyo. No ifs, ands, or buts, except she can take her head off. But Oh, actually, so one last thing. I mentioned it briefly earlier. A lot, if, if you do decide to watch it, and I don't just, I don't know how to put this because I don't want to like, give spoilers or anything, but make sure you pay attention to the episode titles. Yes. Because they're really clever. Some of them are just, we need an episode title to fit in here. But a lot of them are really silly puns based off of other properties. I mean, the first episode is called A Lying Witch and a Warden, which is Narnia. But it also, it's not just they came up with silly puns. Each episode title, I feel, really well fits into what the episode, what the is, episode about. is about. Yeah. And then once you've done all that, if you go back and you read the first letter of every episode name, it spells out a secret message. Really? Yeah. What? I didn't know that. Oh, sorry. My bad. You didn't tell me that. Oh, sorry. My bad. Wait, did you notice it while we were watching it, or did you... I noticed it after the fact when I was staring at uh, the episode titles. Oh, crap. Okay. I guess I'll have to go look at it and find out, read what it says. So... No, no, no. No spoilers. I'm, no, no spoilers. But it was just... I, a lot of the times, couldn't give two shits about what an episode is called. Yeah. But when I started noticing all the puns in the titles because of my own affinity for puns, I started paying more attention, which I think led into this. Because they're just clever and silly and i enjoy it's it's the little touches sometimes that can help add a sparkle yeah you don't need to put sprinkles on a confetti cake but you should because it's a confetti cake that's very american i have no idea what you're talking about <sighs> <laughs> but it's very cute that sounds like a fun cake is that like a fairy cake no okay fairy cake is a british kid's cake i don't think you're allowed to call them that anymore oh my god what <laughs> It's literally because you cut off the top and you cut it in mid in the half and you fill the middle of the cake with icing and then you put the little bits that you cut off on top to look like fairy wings. That's why they're called fairy cakes. Yeah, well, there's also fairy pies in the show and it's terrifying, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess our final takeaway from this is we both enjoyed Owl House. Yeah, very much. And if people are into Western cartoons, they should give it a watch. Definitely, definitely, definitely. And don't look up anything about animation and try not to think about the fact that you're watching a Disney product. Yes. <laughs> and imagine what it could be if Disney hadn't axed it. No. <laughs> Why? Uh, I mean, I'm really glad it, en it ended. Like, I'm glad we got an ending. I think the f conclusion was satisfying. Yes. Yes. Which is more than you can say for a lot of other shows. I'm looking at you, Cora. Centaur World. Oh. Oh, and Centaur World. Yeah. <laughs> Oof, that was another show that got axed and had a really bad second season because of it. Oh, God, the pacing was so bad. The conclusion was ah, so bad. I was so annoyed about that. And so, but I think that it shows a strength of the team that made Owl House and that when they got axed, they still delivered. Yeah. Which you can't say about everyone. No. So. Stand and deliver. Yes. Your money or your life. <laughs> <sighs> Okay, well, that was it for this episode. <laughs> Thanks for listening to another episode of Otofu Susume, or Recommendations from My Otaku Spouse. I was Jen. Oh, wait, uh, no, wait. You can find us. No, you can can't they, find can, us. Can they find us? No, you Social can't. Social media is a cesspit and doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, you can find us at anniebros.com. Anniebroscreative.com. Anniebroscreative.com. Yeah, don't go to anniebros.com. That place is bad. Doesn't even exist? Yeah. Oh, don't go there then. <laughs> <laughs> anniebroscreative.com. But, uh, yeah, you can leave us messages there. Yeah. We enjoy seeing them. We do. We try to respond to them. We do. And every other social media has turned into dumpster fire. So, catch you later. I've been Wesley. I was Jen. Bye. Bye. <laughs>